Okay, so um, let me uh, get us get us started here. Uh, it's it's really wonderful to be welcoming Shannon Baller uh, from the University of Edinburgh to to speak to us today. We're co-sponsoring this with uh, the Center for Advancing Responsible and Ethical Artificial Intelligence Care AI at the University of Guelph. Um, uh, because that I think that talk earlier in the year wasn't able to, to happen. So we're, we also have a wonderful uh, collection of people from Guelph joining us. I think I saw Gus on the list and I don't know if Graham uh, might be here as well, but um, uh, Hi, yes, Graham. I see him now. Hey, Graham and Gus, did I see you? I think I did. Yep, sorry, I got a sleeping baby here. No, no worries, go for it. Um, and just maybe for our for uh, newcomers to our session, uh, so we're, we're an hour and a half and um, uh, Shannon will uh, talk for up to an hour and then we'll have um, hopefully 30 minutes for discussion at least. Um, and please put questions into the chat. Um, I'll monitor that and then I'll call on people afterwards. And uh, Gus and Graham, if you wanna make sure we get uh, your folks in on the conversation, that would be great. Um, although we'll, we'll hold anything except uh, clarifying questions for the start. But let me, let me give Shannon a proper introduction. Uh, Shannon is the Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Edinburgh Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh, uh, where she's also appointed as a professor in the Department of Philosophy. And I should say that uh, I met Shannon, I think it would be about five years ago, Shannon, maybe. Um, um, one of the one of the first uh, philosophers that I started to uh, interact with around AI and AI safety, and she's just been an absolute leader in this field. Um, Shannon's work investigates how human character is being transformed by rapid advances in artificial intelligence, robotics, new social media surveillance, and biomedical technologies. And her writings have appeared in journals such as Ethics and Information Technology, Philosophy and Technology, and Techni. And her 2016 book. Technology and the Virtues, A Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting, is published by Oxford University Press and required reading. Uh, her current research project focuses on the impact of emerging technologies, particularly those involving automation and artificial intelligence, on the moral and intellectual habits, skills, and virtues of human beings. Um, and she's talking to us today, I won't pronounce it right, the Digital Bazinos? Is that I right? And remind myself <laughs> how it's uh, it's Bostonos. Bostonos, okay. AI and the virtue and violence of truth telling. Really looking forward to this. Thanks for joining us, Shannon. Thanks, Jillian, uh, and thanks everyone for uh, for coming. And I'm I'm really happy uh, to hear that uh, the folks from Guelph have been able to join us as well. And apologies for not being able to uh, to make the the talk that was scheduled for that earlier this year. Um, so this talk is uh, really about. Um, the relationship between truth, uh, violence, and technology, and the way that the history uh, of the interweaving of these is being uh, reanimated and, and, um, uh, and amplified and transformed by artificial intelligence. Uh, so uh, it's going to be uh, an interesting, uh, I hope, tour, uh, starting with Aristotle, uh, moving uh, through uh, some uh, examples of contemporary uh, AI research um, and uh, then moving uh, back into philosophy through Foucault uh, on our way out. So uh, I, I hope you uh, will enjoy it. And uh, I, I think it will be provocative. I think there will be uh, lots of things to debate and discuss uh, at the end uh, if I've done my job. So um, let me uh, begin and I always have trouble getting my slides to start. There we go. Um, let me begin by talking about um, the uh, bosonos, uh, which is a Greek word uh, that uh, in its closest uh, translation in the most literal sense uh, would mean the torture stone. Uh, although uh, as I'll point out, it has uh, evolved uh, in meaning in a multitude of ways uh, since antiquity. So uh, the bosonos, uh, is a term that uh, is, is rooted in the uh, historical practice of using a basanite stone to test for the authenticity of gold. Uh, so uh, the way that you would use the stone uh, in this sense is to uh, strike, physically strike a piece of uh, purported gold against the stone. Uh, and there's a particularly 
uh, uh, revealing a distinctive mark left when real gold uh, is uh, struck or rubbed on the bosonos. Uh, but the term uh, later became to refer to any rigorous test or examination which extracts a confession of truth, uh, especially by means of torture. So uh, Aristotle describes uh, the use of bosonos as testimony. Uh, so again, this is a, a sort of uh, metaphorical use. It is not as if uh, the ancient Greeks were actually hitting people with uh, bosonite stones. Uh, it's simply a, a way of describing um, uh, something that they saw as a parallel to the striking of gold on uh, bosonite stone. Uh, and uh, so Aristotle describes uh, bosonos as a form of testimony um, uh, that uh, happened uh, in uh, ancient Athens in a particular context uh, when there was a need to extract a testimony uh, from a slave uh, about the conduct of their master. And so the assumption was that a slave could not be trusted to speak truthfully uh, about his master, uh, in particular uh, because the slave would uh, be able to fear uh, the retribution of the master were the, speak, were the slaves uh, to speak against uh, his master. And so uh, Bosonos was a use of torture against the slave uh, to give the slave sufficient incentive to be truthful uh, in their testimony. Um, so uh, if you wanted a slave to, uh, uh, to uh, reveal uh, some uh, crime or wrongdoing of their master, uh, you would torture the slave uh, in order to extract it. Uh, there's some historical debate about how often this practice was actually uh, employed um, or whether this was uh, sort of discussed as a, as a possibility, uh, but something rarely actually done. Um, but the, the term has continued uh, to uh, be drawn upon in various contexts uh, to refer to uh, the extraction of truth uh, through, uh, through torture. Uh, there's uh, references in uh, scripture, for example, in Matthew uh, to uh, a slave being handed over uh, for torture by his master, uh, where uh, the term use uh, uh, draws from uh, the notion of the bosonos. Okay, so, so that's a, a historical uh, setting. Now, I, I wanna dive into uh, some interesting philosophy here. Um, so Aristotle talks uh, in the rhetoric uh, about the nature of proof uh, and the kinds of proofs or forms of evidence that we rely upon in speech. And he draws a distinction between technical proofs uh, so uh, the word here is the Greek word techne, uh, which is usually translated as craft uh, or art sometimes, uh, but it refers uh, generally to the mechanical arts or the technical arts. Uh, so um, Aristotle describes uh, some proofs as being invented uh, through techne, through craft. And he describes a second class of proofs as atechnical. Uh, meaning they are not technical at all. They are not uh, developed by craft. Uh, instead, these uh, second uh, class of proofs uh, are uh, forms of evidence seen as already in natural existence. Uh, so they simply need uh, to be obtained and heard rather than made. So uh, the proofs already in existence that he lists include witnesses, tortures, where the Greek word here is bazanoi, contracts and the like. And these are to be contrasted with the first class of proofs, uh, which are those that can be constructed by a system and by our own efforts, he says. Uh, so if you think of this first class as logical proofs in the sense if you've ever studied logic and the construction of proofs in arguments, uh, then you'll understand what we might mean by uh, a technical proof, right? Uh, one that is invented. So, uh, Aristotle says we have only to make use of the second kind, the natural proofs that are already out there in the world, whereas we have to invent the former, uh, the logical proofs or the proofs by, uh, by reason. Okay, now what's important about this? Well, there's some really curious things uh, about this claim. 
so first of all, uh, we can see here uh, that uh, there is uh, by Aristotle, this reliable link associated between truth and violence, uh, i.e. torture, right? So uh, torture uh, is a kind of uh, natural truth out there in the world, a, uh, like a witness. Um, but how, how strange is it that Aristotle chooses not to frame torture as a technique, as an invention or a craft? Uh, I want you to sort of think about how easily when we, for example, criticize uh, waterboarding or other modes of uh, torture that are employed in, uh, in warfare or intelligence contexts, we talk about uh, torture techniques routinely, uh, but Aristotle is denying that torture is a technique. Um, and this is in contrast to uh, the kinds of uh, technical crafting of rhetoric and logos, uh, which uh, involves the construction of reasons. Uh, those are seen by Aristotle as techniques. Instead, uh, bosonos is classified by Aristotle as an unmediated natural extraction of truth from the body and not just anyone's body, but the body of a slave. And in fact, the use of the bosonos in antiquity is almost always associated uh, with the torture of uh, non-Greek uh, citizens uh, of slaves. Um, so I want to show in this talk how this oppressive legacy of framing truth as a natural unconstructed extraction by violence um, from the body of those without power has seeped into the way that we build, use, and talk about artificial intelligence. And I also wanna think about new ways forward, ways to break the violent legacy of the Basanos and to perhaps reimagine virtuous modes and technologies of truth-telling. So uh, if you're interested in uh, a deeper discussion of the relationship uh, between torture uh, and truth, uh, and its uh, history, uh, particularly in, um, in Greek thought and practice and the Basanos, uh, then uh, you will find uh, much uh, discussion of this in Paige Dubois' book, uh, Torture and Truth. Uh, and in that book, she says, I want to show how the logic of our philosophical tradition of some of our inherited beliefs about truth leads almost inevitably to conceiving of the body of the other as the site from which truth can be produced and to using violence if necessary to extract that truth. And she goes on to say that before the fifth century BCE, the word basanos appears in the work of aristocratic poets who use it to suggest the necessity for methods of proof of loyalty in a world in which noble dominance is being threatened in which the secure place of the descendants of Homeric heroes can no longer be taken for granted. Uh, so there's a longer discussion of this in the text, but what I want to highlight about this is that the word uh, basanos, even before it's used to describe uh, a form uh, of uh, torture, uh, is associated with uh, the need to preserve uh, political or social hierarchy, uh, the need uh, to prove uh, one's uh, status, uh, to prove one's uh, belonging or non-belonging uh, in a particular uh, social hierarchy. Uh, and I, I think that is uh, going to be significant uh, for uh, my description of a certain class of uses of AI as well. Uh, there's also an interesting discussion of the Basanos in uh, Bernard uh, Harcourt's The Counter-Revolution, uh, which is a critique of uh, the uses in uh, intelligence and military contexts of uh, techniques of, of violence and torture and terror. So this comes through the uh, chapter uh, in that book, Governing Through Terror. He says, there is oddly an uncanny similitude between the actual operation of the Basanos, the tool itself, and the operation of torture. With the tool, the Lydian stone, one rubs gold against the slate, physically ripping pieces of the gold off to see the color of the mark made and left on the slate. Physical torture, it seems, mimics that physical act. It is a rubbing of the physical body against all kinds of tools. In ancient times, the rack or water, still today, the wall slam, the slap, the waterboard, the electrical charge, in order to see the truth. The metaphor of scraping the body like one scrapes gold to see the residue of truth is haunting. 
And what I want to say is that we ought to consider the way in which AI today uh, is being developed in many contexts as a new tool to scrape the body for truth uh, and to scrape it in a way uh, which mirrors uh, some of the characteristic features of the Bassanos, uh, while uh, doing so with at least the illusion of uh, a nonviolent act. Okay. So uh, let me talk about the AI Bassanos and, and what I'm referring to. Uh, so when we see the AI as a, a digital Bassanos, uh, we should be thinking about uses of AI that are designed uh, to extract truths uh, in a, a direct way from the body, uh, usually from images of the body, although uh, we can think about other ways that this will happen, uh, for example, through uh, genetic uh, um, uh, analysis and so forth. Uh, but primarily most of my examples will be about things like facial recognition technology. Uh, my first example here is uh, gait recognition technology. Um, and in, in, in these cases, we are looking for AI to extract truths uh, from the body about our personal identity, uh, about our gender, ethnicity, religion, age, sexual orientation, uh, here I'm thinking of the uh, notorious uh, GADAR study that was uh, put forward by uh, Michelle Kaczynski at Stanford a few years ago, uh, and more recently, uh, a study in which uh, he uh, claims to be, a, and his co-authors claim to be able to detect political orientation uh, from facial images. Uh, we have a massive uh, upsurge of attempts to use AI for sentiment analysis and emotion classification. Uh, we have uh, technologies that are being developed in order uh, to uh, do action prediction. So to be able to look at your body and then predict what you're going to do next. Uh, if you're standing in that uh, store aisle uh, and, and reaching forward, are you going to uh, take that item and put it in your cart? Or are you going to hide it uh, under your shirt and try to walk out with it? Uh, so we have algorithms uh, attempting to do this kind of uh, forward-looking action prediction. Um, we have uh, technologies uh, that are aiming to use AI uh, to uh, track your attentional state. Uh, these kinds of systems are already being used, for example, in classrooms um, uh, in uh, the People's Republic of China uh, to monitor the attentional gaze of children and uh, identify whether they are paying attention to the lesson, whether they're distracted, whether they're bored. Uh, and we have uh, a, a seemingly endless stream of attempts uh, to use the AI as uh, AI systems as tools for extracting personality traits, uh, even things like criminality uh, from images of the face uh, or body or voice, for example. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll have to explain more about the parallel with the Bassanos, uh, but I hope you can already see this one part of it, right? This idea of extracting the truth about these things about you from, uh, from the surface of your body. Uh, so my first example of this is, uh, uh, and, and I, I'm leading off not with the study itself, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, um, but with the way that these studies capture media attention. So here's a Wired piece uh, from last year, uh, uh, in, enthusing, uh, rhapsodically about um, the ability to tell how you're feeling by the way you walk through a uh, gait emotion. And so uh, this is a study uh, uh, about gait-based uh, uh, emotion learning or classification. Um, and so these are images taken from uh, the study that purport to be able uh, to analyze uh, emotional states uh, from uh, patterns of gait. Now, um, the uh, purported use case discussed in the study, um, and, and I'm, I'll, I'll be honest, rather skeptical uh, that this is, a, in fact, the primary use case envisioned for this technology. Uh, but the one discussed in the study is the ability uh, to embed uh, these kinds of uh, capabilities in a robot that could use the algorithm to determine the mood of a pedestrian walking toward it. Uh, so that uh, if the person was in a bad mood, uh, the robot could give it more space. Uh, now, the reason that I'm skeptical about this is because this seems like a solution in search of a problem. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know that we have a lot of issues with people uh, feeling like robots are uh, um, passing them too closely in the halls when they're irritated in a way that wouldn't irritate them when they weren't angry. This just seems bizarre to me that, that someone thought this is a problem that needs to be solved with AI. Um, and I think it's obvious that there are uh, more uh, apparent uses for this technology uh, that are, are far less uh, uh, benign. Uh, but nevertheless, there's no mention of such potential dual uses in this paper, no mention at all of the social and ethical implications uh, of uh, attempting to uh, design this kind of classifier, uh, no, no discussion of the risks of abuse or harm to people, uh, no discussion of the likely bias, uh, uh, given that we already know that uh, there are problems uh, with bias uh, in many forms of, uh, uh, of AI systems and specifically in sentiment analysis, especially when uh, they're trained on data from human labeling of sentiment in images, uh, where we know uh, that there's uh, considerable evidence of both gender and racial bias uh, in human labeling of, uh, of sentiment. Uh, but no discussion of this in the paper uh, and no disclosure of uh, the values behind the choices and assumptions of the designer. Um, and uh, one of the effects of this uh, kind of presentation is that um, it conveys an ironic and yet dangerously compelling illusion. Um, and it's the illusion of a natural atechnic in Aristotle's sense, non-technical extraction of unconsented emotional truth from the subject's body, uh, which we can imagine having been virtually rubbed against the touchstone of the algorithm. Uh, and, and these illusions are reinforced when we hear people say, you know, math doesn't lie, data doesn't lie, uh, as, as if these are unconstructed, atechnical, um, uh, quasi-magical seeings into the truth of things. Um, of course, we know that's uh, could not be further from, from the truth of what's happening here. Um, and in fact, um, this is what I an example of what I call zombie AI. Um, and, and I call it zombie AI uh, because this kind of research is routinely a debunked, but it just keeps coming. Um, zombie AI research is research that isn't well put together, so you can knock it down quite easily. And in fact, researchers routinely find themselves knocking down these kinds of, uh, of, of claims uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first is to fight against harmful AI and the unjust systems that produce it, right? Just to recognize that, um, uh, that we need to prevent uh, uh, these um, kinds of uh, technologies from uh, being used in ways that are um, unethical. Uh, but there's also another motivation, I think, which is to protect legitimate uses of AI from being tarnished by association um, uh, and uh, to prevent AI adoption from being suppressed by its growing association with unethical and often unscientific applications. Uh, so you see here a tweet uh, about the study shortly after uh, the Wired piece came out from Tim O'Brien at Microsoft Research saying, just absolute nonsense garbage tech. Um, and Tim was hardly alone in uh, describing uh, the conclusions of the research in this way. Um, yet these kinds of studies um, seem to pop up literally every 48 hours, it seems, in my Twitter feed. Um, and, 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 and this doesn't seem to be slowed down in any way by the fact that often uh, you find these kinds of studies uh, not only drawing uh, peer criticism and, and rejection, uh, but often leading to paper retractions or other forms of career embarrassment. I'll give some examples. And so one of the reasons I wanna uh, look at this is it, it doesn't seem to, to make rational sense, right? That scientists would continue to put forward forms uh, of uh, research that were uh, debunked and, uh, and uh, regarded as unscientific uh, by their own peers and own research community. And yet we keep seeing these studies uh, come forward like waves of zombies. Also the zombies are racist. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, knowledge we have of uh, the problems in sentiment analysis uh, uh, technology, uh, uh, sentiment recognition uh, with race and gender bias. Uh, there's also uh, problems here with bias against people with disabilities, um, uh, people uh, of, uh, of different age groups. 
um, there's there's lots of different forms of, of bias that that uh, we find in these uh, technologies. But here's just one example from a study in 2018 of the racial influence on automated perception of emotions. Uh, here, the researcher Lauren Rue uh, used um, uh, roster photos uh, from a basketball league uh, because uh, here you don't have confounding effects with the differences between, uh, for example, the, the kind of camera that was used or the background. The backgrounds are the same, the size and framing is the same, the lighting is the same. Uh, the only differences are the players themselves. And uh, what her research found is that all of the commercial facial recognition platforms had problems uh, in, in the area of, uh, of, of uh, fairness with respect and accuracy with respect to different uh, racial or ethnic groups. So um, the uh, uh, programs, the software, uh, were uh, consistently classifying Black players' faces as having more negatively valenced emotions, uh, either more contemptuous, angrier, more fearful, or just generally less happy. Um, even when controlling for objective smile degree. So you can actually measure the position of the smile in the face and hold that uh, uh, steady and then look at how uh, the emotion is being rated and notice these disparities. Okay, um, and the racist zombies are in unfortunately uh, widespread use in many cases. Uh, AI now has done uh, uh, an examination of the systematic use of dirty data to train uh, predictive policing AI tools. Uh, they found nine of 13 precincts were using demonstrably biased or dirty data sources. Uh, the other four were simply ambiguous about uh, uh, the um, quality of the data. And uh, they found no evidence of AI vendors independently validating the policing data that was used to train the systems. And they found few, if any, efforts by police departments or predictive system vendors to assess or mitigate the dirty data problem. Uh, so uh, when we have these technologies uh, that, are, that are being used uh, primarily against uh, marginalized populations, we have very uh, few efforts uh, to validate them scientifically uh, and, uh, and also to ensure uh, ethical rigor in their application. Uh, in, in many of these cases, uh, what we see is a disturbing uh, prevalence of studies uh, that uh, have been called by more than one uh, uh, critic. Um, uh, I'm thinking here of Abebe Berhane, who's uh, been uh, uh, very good about uh, tracking these and, and, and uh, uh, exposing their, um, uh, their status, essentially as uh, I think she may have called them at one point three phrenologists in a trench coat. Uh, many of these algorithms are, are really um, just re very, very obvious transparent attempts to reanimate phrenology uh, or physiognomy or any number of discredited versions of race science from uh, the 18th and 19th century that attempted uh, to use uh, uh, quite uh, readily uh, debunked uh, scientific uh, techniques uh, to associate um, personality traits, negative personality traits in particular, uh, uh, with uh, particular uh, kinds of faces uh, uh, or particular kinds of uh, skull shapes uh, notoriously. So uh, we have uh, a large number of phrenologist zombies. Um, uh, these examples are from last year, but I've got a, li a list of examples just from the past few months. So these have, the zombies have not slowed down, they're still coming. Um, in this study from Hashimi and Paul, uh, they describe this as the uh, first uh, milestone in our attempt to infer personality traits from facial images, and they claimed a test accuracy of 97%. Uh, this study uh, was uh, roundly debunked by a group of IEEE scholars who noted that the training data were rife with confounding variables, uh, most notably that all of the non-criminal images um, were of, uh, from sort of diverse kinds of cameras and, and backgrounds, and all of the criminal photos were mugshots of the same image format and camera type. So of course, what they had built was not a criminal detector, but a mugshot detector. Uh, but what's striking here, if you uh, notice in, uh, in the opening uh, lines of, of the paper, uh, they say this study is triggered by Lombroso's research, which showed that criminals could be identified by their facial structure and emotions. Again, uh, Lombroso's research is among uh, the bodies of scientific research that were 
um, uh, uh, thoroughly debunked and discredited earlier in uh, the, the 20th century. Uh, and yet here they are reanimated uh, without any uh, description of uh, the work as having been uh, discredited and rejected by the scientific community. Um, and the zombies keep coming. So here's an example uh, from uh, a press release from Harrisburg University uh, from last year, where they claimed uh, uh, to have performed a similar feat of uh, designing facial recognition software that predicts criminality with 80% accuracy and no racial bias. The software can predict if someone is a criminal based solely on a picture of their face. Uh, of of course, this study, uh, which notably one of the researchers was a former NYPD police officer, um, uh, had to uh, watch as their own comms department retracted this press release due, uh, due to the immediate firestorm of rebuke uh, by prominent scientists of its irresponsibility, uh, which was followed by the researchers promising to release uh, their research once they had addressed these concerns. Uh, Shortly after that, there was uh, yet another uh, um, uh, case of uh, this kind of uh, scientific uh, uh, controversy, I'll put that lightly, uh, over uh, a piece published in Nature Communications um, that uh, claimed uh, to be uh, drawing conclusion, able to draw conclusions about uh, trustworthiness and judgments of trustworthiness uh, by looking at uh, facial structures uh, as depicted in paintings. Um, so uh, uh, lauded uh, computing pioneer uh, and BCS uh, Lovelace Medal winner Brady Booch tweeted, uh, this paper is an epic failure on every level, assumptions, process, data science, and ethical foundations, bad science all around. Um, the, one of the authors, Nicholas Bomard, uh, published this image from the study uh, talking about how they have designed an algorithm to automatically generate trustworthiness evaluations for these facial uh, action uh, units. Um, and, and frankly, you know, the uh, echoes of, uh, of 19th century and 20th century uh, uh, physiognomy and, and phrenology are, are, are quite vivid, although there was an extensive debate on Twitter about whether the study was actual phrenology or merely phrenology adjacent. Um, there was, uh, in fact, uh, a, a way of qualifying the claims of the study, which was that they were uh, not judging actual trustworthiness, uh, but really uh, looking at how people assess trustworthiness from faces. Um, uh, but uh, regardless, the uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, there was not very much attempt by the researchers to make that distinction clear. Uh, and uh, as a result of the firestorm of peer criticism, uh, Nicholas Beaumard deleted his Twitter account shortly thereafter. Uh, but a few days after that, he and co-author Lou Safra contributed uh, to a September 29th article in the UK tabloid The Sun, using their algorithm to rate the trustworthiness of 11 celebrities and politicians. Uh, quoting from the Sun article, reality veteran Kim Kardashian has been awarded top marks in a study conducted by the Sun that rates trustworthiness. Notably, she scored ahead of uh, the queen uh, and also Joe Biden, uh, with experts saying her face shows her to be truly dependable, according to the algorithm which rates apparent trustworthiness that they developed. The Sun goes on to say, in general, the scientists have previously explained that females appear less dominant and more maternal, which makes them more trustworthy. Okay, so I hope I've made my case that there is a whole lot of garbage research going on under the banner of AI that the AI community is rightly pushing back against, and yet the zombies keep coming. Why? Why? Why would you continue to develop? Uh, uh, applications uh, and techniques uh, that have been discredited for over a century and that your colleagues rightly uh, regard as unscientific and unworthy of publication. Um, and, and yet people keep going back to this poisoned well. Well, I think one explanation has to be looked for in history uh, and in the legacy of the relationship between violence, uh, technology and truth. Uh, and I um, uh, was uh, provoked to think about uh, the uh, quote in the film Magnolia, um, 
uh, echoing uh, Faulkner's Requiem from a Nun. And the book says, we may be through with the past, but the past isn't through with us. And I don't think the past is through with AI. So I think the problem is that there is in the AI field uh, um, uh, a, an uptake of an evidently irrepressible and deeply unscientific impulse to produce a digital bassanos that will extract confessions from the body and that can be deployed on those without the power to consent or refuse. Uh, and that is the remarkable thing about uh, virtually all of these uh, proposals to use AI in this way is that they're envisioned as being used on people without their consent, without often even their knowledge. Um, and so it is uh, a, a peculiar kind of basanos. It's not a basanos that reaches out and strikes the body of the subject. Uh, and yet nevertheless, uh, it scrapes uh, the, the body of the subject uh, in order to obtain a confession, usually a confession, uh, in this case, not against one's master, but against oneself. Um, and uh, which uh, does so in a way uh, that um, will uh, almost exclusively uh, benefit those in power uh, and a place at risk those who are already vulnerable or marginalized. Um, so how do we resist this impulse and can we purge it from AI's legacy? Um, and of course, I hope it's clear that what I'm describing here is not all of AI research. I'm describing a particular cluster of AI uh, research that seems to be uh, uh, particularly inexplicable in its resilience. In order to try to talk about this uh, in, a, in a philosophical way, I'm going to take us in the final section of my talk through a discussion of uh, Foucault uh, and his uh, remarks about uh, truth telling and the Bassanos. Uh, so I'm, I'm largely going to be drawing here from uh, Foucault's uh, uh, last lectures in 1983 and 1984, The Government of Self and Others and the Courage of Truth. Um, and there uh, he talked extensively about uh, the practice of uh, parousia, uh, which is a, a kind of truth telling, but a very special kind. It entails telling all without reserve to hide nothing and say what is true regardless of the consequences. Uh, so parousia is a form of truth telling that involves assuming personal and political risk. It thus can only be wielded where one can be hurt by others' rejection of your claims and authority, by their anger or withdrawal of friendship and affection, or by a physical attack. The truth told in parousia is the truth subject to risk of violence. But in the original form of political parousia uh, that uh, Foucault describes, it's used exclusively by the powerful. Uh, the weak cannot uh, make a, a, a claim uh, to use parousia um, uh, because the, 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 the weak are, are not in a position of power. Um, the act of parousia is an act of telling the truth in a way that in which you choose to suspend your power temporarily and expose yourself to risk of harm from those less powerful. So for example, when you speak the truth to an angry crowd as a leader in such a way that you expose yourself to harm from the mob, but you tell them the hard truth that they need to hear, right? That's an act of uh, parousia. It's an act of truth telling that involves uh, personal and political risk. Now, why am I talking about this? Um, I, I think it'll become clear uh, soon enough. Um, so uh, Foucault says, this is from Government of Self and Others, uh, parousia is in a way a discourse spoken from above, which comes from a source higher than the status of the citizen and which is different from the pure and simple exercise of power. It leaves others the freedom to speak and allows freedom to those who have to obey or leaves them free insofar as they will only obey if they can be persuaded. So you're telling people, um, here's the truth, you can decide whether to accept it or reject it. Uh, even though I have the power, if I chose, to force you to accept it, but I won't. Um, so Foucault goes on to say, what constitutes parousia is, I think, the exercise of a form of discourse which persuades others whom one commands, and which in an agonistic game allows freedom for others who also wish to command. Uh, but he describes in The Courage of Truth a turn from political parousia to ethical parousia. And this turn, he says, happens in the uh, uh, appearance of the character of Socrates. Uh, 
Um, so all parousia, given its intrinsic risk, presupposes a certain virtue, uh, courage in particular, uh, because of the risk of, of violence uh, that is associated with this form of truth telling. Uh, but unlike rhetoric, Soc uh, Socratic parousia is not the exercise of a technical skill, Foucault says, but something closer to a virtue itself. Uh, for uh, Foucault says its mode of veridiction is not techne, but ethos. Uh, so he describes parousia as a mode of truth telling that is distinct from that of the prophet, the sage, or the teacher. Unlike the prophet, um, uh, parousia speaks directly uh, uh, without riddles or puzzles. Unlike the sage, it addresses moral particularities or facts uh, uh, of a concrete form rather than general abstract principles. Uh, and unlike the teacher who sim simply seeks to deliver knowledge, uh, parousia sets the listener a moral task to attend to. Uh, and Foucault says the subject of this form of truth telling is the style of ethical life or bios. Uh, he describes this uh, kind of truth telling as a discourse of care, epimelea, care of the self, as well as those within one's care. Um, he, he says that the, there is a problem, however, though, of who's qualified to exercise this practice. And Foucault suggests that the qualification is a kind of moral consistency or integrity of character. Uh, and he sees Socrates as the embodiment of the kind of person who has the right uh, to use uh, ethical parousia, someone who lives the truth they speak. Um, to establish this qualification, Foucault says, though, requires an examination of a kind, a test, a basanos. Okay, now I'm gonna be bringing it back to the earlier part of the talk. Because the examined life, Foucault says, is a basanos. Uh, it involves submitting one's life to what uh, he calls a touchstone, a test, which enables one to distinguish between the good and the bad one has done in life. And Socrates, gives himself as the Basanos, uh, the touchstone. And by rubbing against him through confrontation uh, with him in uh, the Elenchus or the Socratic uh, argument, one will be able to distinguish between what is and is not good in one's life. So Foucault says one's existence, the form of one's style of existence or bios must be constantly subject to the Basanos it is as Basanos, as the person who makes each person justify his life, all his life, and throughout his life, that Socrates is called upon. So what I'm describing here is, is an interesting idea in Foucault about a form of the Basanos um, that is ethical, uh, as opposed to a form of the Basanos uh, that is used as an instrument uh, to oppress or control. So here's my closing thoughts about this. Uh, and I'll be able to wrap up in the next five minutes or so, I think. Um, so first of all, is I think AI, going back to my earlier remarks, um, is currently trading upon our desire to escape the labor and risk entailed by truth-telling via logos or the construction of reasons. Um, I think we've become rather cynical about uh, the use of reason um, about the trustworthiness of those who deploy reason in the public sphere in particular, but also in the private sphere. And AI is a way of promising us direct access to the truth without the labor and risk that comes from answering and hearing of reasons. But what's interesting uh, about this also is that the technical power of giving reasons uh, of the logos has historically been reserved for the elite. Uh, it is, it is a logic and, and uh, the art of crafting arguments is something historically and still today uh, taught primarily only uh, to the wealthiest and most privileged among us. Um, and I don't think this is an accident. Uh, it's worth pointing out that those who master logos also necessarily gain uh, many of the powers of rhetoric, including the technical skill to lie effectively. Uh, and one might argue that elites have a vested interest in keeping that particular techne for themselves. So this creates, uh, I, I uh, hypothesize, a political problem for elites who seek, uh, like those that Page Dubois described uh, in, in Torture and Truth, who seek to preserve their place in the hierarchy, uh, there's a problem. The oppressed cannot be made to answer for themselves with reasons. 
Because in order to ask that of them, they would have to be given the power of logos, the power of rhetoric, the power of constructing, the techne of constructing reasons and arguments. Uh, and that would give them power. So uh, somehow oppressed and marginalized peoples must be made to answer for themselves without reason, bypassing reasons, uh, because they have to be systematically deprived of that power. So we need to be able, uh, from the standpoint of the elite seeking to maintain power, we need to be able to make those uh, without power answer for themselves uh, without speech, without logos. And I think that is partly uh, how we get long before AI, uh, an interest in methods and techniques of extracting truth unconsented from the body, uh, supposedly in its natural and atechnic form. Because of course, if we admitted that we were doing this in a way that was invented or constructed, then that would cast into doubt, uh, potentially uh, the authenticity of the truth extracted. So uh, we have to be able to say uh, that the truth we're extracting from the body is, uh, uh, is pure and unaltered and in its natural state. And I think this aim has been pursued through centuries upon centuries of attempts to perfect the art of torture, despite uh, ongoing evidence of its actual unreliability, similar in some ways, right, to zombie AI. Torture is a zombie political technique. Uh, we have uh, much evidence that it's unreliable in extracting truthful testimony, and yet uh, governments don't stop using it. Um, as Harcourt and Dubois show, from the rack to waterboarding to the 30-hour interrogations that yielded the false confessions of the now exonerated Central Park Five in the United States, uh, there's a long history predating AI uh, of seeking to fulfill this dream of uh, the uh, natural extraction of uh, truth, or at least something that will pass for truth uh, from the powerless or the disempowered. Um, and I think AI is uh, not a, some sort of new form of, uh, uh, of oppression in when, when we see it doing this. Um, it's simply uh, something that has been um, activated by this same impulse. Because I think AI today presents itself uh, to many, uh, particularly who, those who are interested in securing and defending their power in the status quo as the fulfillment uh, of this uh, long held uh, dream. And of course, this is the height of irony since AI is an exquisitely constructed technology. By definition, it's artificial. It's a non-natural mode of knowledge production. Um, uh, there is nothing, uh, sort of anyone who works in AI knows there is nothing simple and natural about the way that AI systems extract uh, insights or truth. Um, it is an arduous uh, and highly uh, constructed and uh, artificial process. Doesn't mean it doesn't have use or that it can't be accurate. It simply just couldn't be further from something atechnical. And an even richer irony is that when it is being deployed as a digital bosonos, we are seeing that AI technology is often highly opaque, unreliable, and misleading. And in the examples I've given, at least, consistently fails the scientific and moral tests to which it is put. And again, I'm talking here about this specific subset of AI applications and not AI in general, um, although there are broader questions about um, modes of validation of, of, of AI methodologies and, um, and models. So the question I wanna ask is how can we, if we can, untether AI from this legacy of technical violence? Can the uses and designers uh, of digital bosonoi be subjected to a Socratic bosonos of ethical parousia? Um, I think it's interesting uh, along these lines to consider a, a different kind of digital technology, um, uh, namely social media, which I think in some cases is being used as an alternative uh, bosonic force. We might think of it as a counter bosonos. Um, now I want to, to caution uh, that I, I think this is quite limited and, and, um, and, and fragile as, as a phenomenon. If we think about Twitter, it brings the power and danger of rhetoric uh, and parousia to the many, but it also drowns the truth in a flood of bullshit. Um, but social platforms in combination with the smartphone camera have become, in some cases at least, a kind of counter uh, basinos, something used to extract unconsented truth from the bodies of the powerful. And I want you to think about the conviction of Derek Chauvin yesterday uh, as a result uh, almost uh, entirely 
of the recording of his killing of George Floyd uh, by a bystander who would not have had the power or social standing to challenge Derek Chauvin in any other way, other than by having this tool in her hand, which she could use to show what he had done and to make it instantly accessible uh, to others and who could do that without Chauvin's consent. Um, and we think about the use of this kind of technology against the various Amy Coopers and barbecue Beckys of the world. And I'm certainly not suggesting this is a panacea for racism or police uh, uh, violence or any other uh, social ill. What I'm saying is uh, you, you do see a sort of proof of concept, if you will, that technologies can be used as a counter basonic instrument to extract truth from the bodies of the powerful. So I'm interested in this question is, can AI be saved by uh, uh, ethical parousia? Uh, can it be subjected to the basinos? Uh, could it uh, uh, in fact be tested um, uh, in, in the same sort of rigorous way as uh, Socrates uh, tested others? This would require that AI system developers willingly expose their designs to critical testing of their scientific and moral integrity. And it would mean that they would have to accept the risk of commercial failure and public rejection. Remember, uh, parousia requires courage, the courage to, to fail, the courage to have your power taken away if the truth you speak is not recognized. Well, um, how do we subject AI to that kind of courageous test? Um, I also am interested in the question of whether ethical AI, uh, like we see social media occasionally being used, uh, is there a way of deploying AI as a counter, uh, Basinos? That is, can it be designed to extract truth from resistant systems of power and make silent forms of oppression speak? Or uh, here's another perhaps more radical possibility of which I'm quite uncertain. Could AI be designed as a tool of Socratic basinos itself? Can it be used as a way to test our own moral integrity and consistency as a mirror to see if our own styles of living or bios reflect the values uh, or ethos that we speak? So these are the provocative questions that I want to leave you with today. Uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed uh, the conversation and uh, the, um, or, uh, uh, or rather this side of the conversation, I'm waiting for the other. Uh, and um, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Shannon. That's just uh, lovely, really, really wonderful. Uh, we'll, there we go, so we can see faces here, uh, terrific. Um, and I will uh, take some questions. I'm gonna go to Matt Ratto first. Oh, thank you. Um, wow, I have, <laughs> I have to process that amazing talk. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon. It was really great to see the, the looping in, the loops between Foucault and Aristotle and Socrates. Um, I guess uh, I, <laughs> I guess I have a really general question to ask about your work, which is about what you've expressed here today. And that's whether or not AI actually involves something different from what we might consider this kind of standard practice of scientific truth-making um, in, in the sense that it too comes from, uh, oftentimes from the scraping of bodies uh, who are often also powerless. Um, it often uses processes of objectification and ration, rationalization similar to what you just described. Um, and uh, uh, it too uh, primarily leverages what we might call a, a codes of professional conduct, which are often fairly fairly weak, weak ways to uh, uh, put people at risk in the way that you just described. So, mm -hmm. and and I know that you know you know it, it's always this kind of easy move to just say is there something different about this, but I think I think there is, and so I'm I'm, but I don't quite know how to articulate it. So I'm wondering if you have. Yeah. The way to talk about it as something that is either qualitative or, um, or in terms of scope, different from the sort of standard practice of scientific truth. Yeah, um, I think uh, there's a there's a few aspects of this. Um, first of all, uh, the sort of scale, uh, potentially scale of deployment. Um, most scientific research uh, is quite uh, quite costly, uh, uh, quite uh, labor intensive and usually limited in scope. Uh, of course, it can be uh, scaled up into technical applications, but the, the science itself is, is usually uh, relatively sort of local 
uh, in its, right? You do a study with, I don't know, you know, a, a few hundred, uh, maybe if you're lucky, a uh, thousand uh, subjects. Um, and so the, the science itself uh, doesn't easily uh, attain the kind of scale that we see with, with AI systems uh, that once built can be uh, deployed uh, on, you know, millions or billions of users. Um, and so I think that's one, one uh, sort of difference. Um, by the way, I, my answer should make it clear. I don't think there's a sort of radical sharp break here. I think what you're describing in the sciences um, are activations of many of the same sort of patterns of oppression and, and, um, and marginalization that we see in every institution. Of course, we're going to see it in science. It's not somehow pure and protected from every other aspect of, uh, of society and its incentives. And we'll see it in AI and every other technology uh, as well. But I, although AI isn't radically different and is a sort of just a, a kind of next evolution, if you will, in, in many of these um, dimensions, I do think there are some qualitative differences. Uh, aside from the scale, uh, the uh, relative, um, um, invisibility of the activity of AI systems, particularly when we're talking about applications of computer vision um, or um, audio surveillance or other uh, ways of surreptitiously uh, extracting data from us uh, that, are, um, that are analyzed without our knowledge. Uh, when you uh, take part in a scientific study, uh, again, you might be misled about the purposes of that study and there are many uh, uh, ways in which we manage the ethical risks associated with that. Sometimes, uh, historically, uh, we ignore those uh, ethical requirements and uh, experiment on subjects without uh, their knowledge. Uh, and, and these unfortunate um, uh, uh, crimes against, uh, uh, against uh, humanity have been well documented. Um, but those uh, are not sort of the routine default mode of, of scientific activity. The default mode of scientific, scientific activity is that you participate in research knowingly. Um, most of us are unaware and will be unaware of uh, the ways in which we become subjects of these kinds uh, of uh, technologies. Um, and so I, I think the, the ability of AI to be deployed in ways that are invisible to us um, and yet affect us uh, powerfully um, is, is something that uh, is, is perhaps at least qualitatively uh, distinct with AI. Um, and the potential of AI systems to, um, to amplify historical patterns and replicate them at scale uh, means that I think AI has uh, more so than other forms of, of scientific and technical activity um, a, a cons an inherently conservative force that actually has to be countered and managed. And by conservative, I mean it wants to take the past and push it into the future. It wants to preserve the historical patterns. And I say wants, of course, in this like loose metaphor, of course, AI doesn't want anything. Um, but the point is, is that uh, when it works, it generally works by projecting the past into the future uh, and then guiding people to act according to those expectations and predictions thus ensuring that the future remains more or less configured in the same way as the past has been. Um, and when AI systems fail, it's normally because this doesn't work for us and uh, the, the future is meaningfully different or we want it to be meaningfully different in ways that we notice. Uh, but what, what I worry about is all the cases in which we don't notice. We don't notice the sort of conservative force where AI is reinforcing unjust uh, social relations and preserving them in precisely the way that the Bassanos was designed to do. Great. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Shannon. Gia. Oh, hi, Shannon. Oh, hi, Shannon. Thank you hi. very much. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I really enjoy this, um, this topic and your talk and all the uh, wonderful projects you shared and other present uh, other publications so you know like i'm from original i'm from china and in asian china we also have this like for thousands of years or at least two thousand years and we have the face reading is in chinese we call the xiangshu i just searched uh, i think the equivalent term is video only 
<laughs> I don't know if I pronounce it correct. So it's to judge characters from facial um, um, facial expression and to tell people's fate from how they look, or the hidden history, your current situation, your future development, or uh, even from your palm itself. Mm -hmm. And so people's face reveal is their fate. So it's like a long term practice in the society at least in my country, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, and recently it's, of course it's a pseudoscience, but for a long time it's practiced uh, in the society by the general public. And also uh, I feel this, the topic is very interesting because uh, it's, not about, it's not about technology, computer or AI itself, because when we read literature and for the classical literature, we can tell people's character from how they look, right? We describe people like smelling, like red, um, their uh, big eyes or their high nose to simplify how they, what other the character. So people are in, deeply influenced by what is going on in the society in, on the street and also in the literature. So right now it's like the, uh, I really think um, like appreciate how say like political risk brought by AI, especially in a powerful way is very dangerous. So I think the computerized face reading has like the short sugar covered outside because the technology, the AI. So it's covered this long traditional like face reading, especially like when we claim it to for decision making alone is pretty dangerous. But my, uh, it's, in, it's not a question. It's just, I want to hear your thoughts about like your solution or suggestions. How can we um, like debate or argue about this issue? Because I think this is not AI itself alone. This is exists in the society, exists in the literature, and this is in practice. It's not about AI itself. And how can we um, bring all this together to maybe increase public awareness? So it's not about AI, the algorithm itself. So all the data or algorithm are from people, right? Are from humans and then designed by humans and then in turn to be applied in human. So that's my question. I'm thinking about this, everything together. So I want yeah. to hear your thoughts about it. Sure. Um, so I, I agree with you wholeheartedly uh, that what we're talking about is not a, a form of harm or a form of violence that originated with AI um, and even uh, its Im embedded uh, uh, ness in AI is, as you say, entirely a result of human agency, human choices, uh, human power relations. Um, uh, the AI uh, systems are constructed to do certain kinds of things that humans value. It's because we value exclusion as a social practice uh, and uh, uh, forms of classification and, and, uh, and, and uh, hierarchy formation uh, that are used for political purposes. It's what, that's why that's what AI is good at. It's because it's one of the first things we were motivated to try to do with these systems. And so, um, I, but I, I take this and I think I hear in your comment, uh, perhaps a similar um, source of, of hope or optimism because of that, that's actually, an, an opportunity because it means that we don't have to have this kind of AI. There are different forms of AI that could exist. It is not the case that AI is somehow metaphysically destined uh, to uh, be employed uh, in these uh, oppressive or exclusionary ways. Um, and in order to, uh, to find different paths uh, for AI and other uh, socio-technical systems, right? Um, in order to find those new paths, uh, I think as, as your comment points out, uh, what we have to do is look at ourselves and not just in the recent uh, uh, past, but um, uh, look at the sort of historical patterns. And that was what I was trying to do with my talk because in AI ethics, we often don't go back to antiquity and we often don't go back to uh, anything you know, past the 1960s. We start with Alan Turing and go from there, right? Um, and what, I, what I'm trying to say is, and, and that was that slide about the past is not, uh, is not done with us. I think, um, I think as you point out, these historical pra practices, uh, yes, in China, uh, but, but not only in China, in virtually every uh, 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 longstanding cultural tradition, there's some way of finding a shortcut to sorting people into us versus them, trustworthy versus untrustworthy, um, 
uh, uh, status versus uh, uh, deprived of status. Um, these ways of excluding and sorting and um, empowering and disempowering one another are, uh, are as we know, unfortunately, uh, deeply embedded in uh, human uh, political life. Uh, and yet we have again and again become aware of other ways to exist, identified those, discussed those, chosen those as our ideals and moved our institutions slowly, painfully, incompletely towards those ideals. Uh, there's a reason why I can be uh, a professor, uh, why I can drive, why I can own my own property. Um, whereas a hundred years ago, none of those things would have been possible. Um, and so I, I think just as there's hope for AI, there's hope for people uh, to recognize these historical patterns. And it doesn't matter how far back they run. What matters is that we have the power to see uh, their illegitimacy. We have to, the power to see the patterns of harm that they continue to produce, uh, the way they diminish and have always diminished uh, the potential for human flourishing uh, and, uh, and motivate us to find ways uh, to create better ways of being and better ways of being together. So that's what ethics I think is about. Ethics is about finding more just ways of living together. Um, and I think technology is about finding a better uh, ways to exist in the built world. Um, and so I think ethics and technology can both have these um, uh, progressive and, and reconstructive forces, um, but there's a lot of incentives to fight against to make that happen. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Gia, and thanks, thanks, Shanna. I'm just going to insert one comment here, abuse the power of the chair here, just because I think your point about the power of, you know, where is this technology being, which body is it being uh, trained on? You know, we could say, you know, we, we, we've responded to, say, the Amazon hiring algorithm by saying, oh, we've got biased data, we need to fix that system. You could say, actually, train that. that it's showing us what that history is. It's showing us what that pattern is. Um, and uh, you know that could be the starting point. That could be the center of of that technology, rather than the uses to which it's being put. And uh, the that, that 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 what your emphasis at the end on the power and um, where it's being trained is just really really illuminating. I'm going to go to Brian. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, that was really fabulous, and not just fabulous, but important. Um, um, so thank you very much. Um, it's also curious because I have rarely agreed so wholeheartedly with a talk in spite of being disquiet at the philosophical foundation. So, and I think that's really interesting actually. So I was troubled at the beginning by its seeming lack of clarity about the relationship between sort of evidence and truth and testimony and the real world situations that are actually the locus of the truth. And, you know, I think of truth as a relationship between between epistemic practices and ontological situations and stuff, even if one's constructivist in one's intuition and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and the whole idea of extracting truth, like when we were talking about the slaves and stuff, you know, I worried about extracting truth from a slave if in fact they're being grilled about their master or whatever. But what's, what's striking to me, and this is my question, it seems to me that there's something that either about AI or just about your cleverness in framing this, but I think it's actually more than that. There's something very compelling and urgent, it seems to me, about the situations you describe and the approaches we need to do justice to and the importance of ethical precia and so on and so forth that can be kind of agreed by people in spite of maybe having different um, traditional philosophical foundations. Um, mm -hmm. You could be a realist, you can be constructivist and so on and so forth. And I'm just curious your comments on that. Um, how is it, is it just urgency that makes this sort of Catholic with respect to a lot of philosophical starting points? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think <laughs> sometimes I think there's, uh, let me just sort of say that as a philosopher, uh, when I started working on AI, I got a lot of resistance for a long time from the philosophical community 
Um, there was a small subset of philosophers that were interested in this with me, um, yeah. but I can't tell you how many philosophers uh, in my own departments and in others thought I wasn't doing philosophy if I was talking about technology and particularly talking about AI. And I, I wonder if there's a certain sort of philosophical uh, jealousy or threat, if you will, uh, insofar as AI uh, aims to be um, a, a kind of uh, artificial replication of the thing that philosophers above all hold to be uh, precious and, and, and unique uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the human mind, the capacity to reason and judge and so forth. So, I mean, maybe part of the sort of Catholic appeal, if you will, of, of these kinds of critiques is that philosophers are, are, are primed to see AI in, through a lens of suspicion. Um, but I think there's also a, a, a recognition that the a way in which AI generates what gets called truth um, is something that has not undergone the kinds of epistemic, uh, rigorous epistemic critique uh, that philosophers uh, are, are used to. And so think about, for example, um, how much uh, of the sort of footprint, if you will, of 20th century and 21st century philosophy is taken up by philosophy of science. Um, philosophers spend a lot of time thinking about science uh, and thinking about the legitimacy of science and how to, um, how to ground it, uh, what its limits are and so forth. Um, and I think that uh, the way that traditional scientific reasoning under, is understood is quite different in form from the kind of knowledge that's getting produced uh, by uh, what we call AI or machine learning systems. Um, not only because when it's produced by particular kinds of you know, deep learning uh, uh, models that, that the knowledge might be opaque and hard to reconstruct, there's that. Right? And that doesn't make us comfortable when we think about knowledge as something where we ought to be able to identify the premises and figure out what the logical and causal connections are. Um, there's also just the sort of stochastic nature of, of AI reasoning that um, behaves in ways that occasionally strike us as quite alien. Um, so the more you know about AI, the more unlike human reasoning you, uh, you realize it is. The kinds of errors that it makes are just wildly unlike the kinds of errors that a human solving the same problem will make. Um, and so I think there's maybe within sort of the philosophical community a recognition that whatever truth is and whatever knowledge is, we don't understand very well. And certainly people, the people using AI don't understand very well uh, the conditions of, of epistemic legitimacy behind AI judgments. I think that's what we can all agree on. Um, but there's, also, there's also a really interesting point that um, computer science has redefined all intentional vocabulary, like things like semantics and meaning and reference and, and all of that kind of stuff to mean causal and machine internal things. And so therefore computer science has lost the vocabulary to talk about the stuff that has been intentionally important in philosophy and science, which, yeah. which I think is really tragic and actually um, fits into this idea of the phrenology and so on and so forth that the, even even what computer science calls semantics is going to be you know skull internal or something which i think is actually a disaster but let me just say this i want to thank you for your center in edinburgh and thank um you know julian headfield and the sri here because i think you know i have my list of 476 philosophers who haven't thought it's possible to study ai in a philosophically interesting way and so if we can have two centers on either side yes. of the pond Fabulous. Yeah, I'm right. into that. Yeah. All right. Good. The, the uh, we have 15 minutes left, and I uh, the order I had on questions was Gus, then Marlene, and then Avery. So Gus, let's get to yours. Okay. Um. Thanks, Shannon. Um. Hey, Gus. So I wanted to. Hi. Hey, um, little one. Yeah. Um. So I noticed like a it may, maybe an interesting tension. I'm not sure. Like you can tell me. Um, but I was pretty struck by the fact that um, the idea of the digital bosnos is one that's, you know, uncovering, um, uncovering this truth and like, and like that, that's the metaphor for AI. And, and I'm struck by how different that seems than a lot of like the kind of first wave or at least early critical data studies. Um, so I'm thinking of, you know, papers by like Jake Metcalf and, and Kate Crawford and some of their early work, which was really concerned with like the way that big data and AI creates new forms of subjectivity, 
right? And so that, that it sort of creates these new forms rather than uncovers them. And so maybe this is just like, you know, like they have a different subset of AI technologies in mind than, than the ones you have in mind in your talk, but it just struck me that like it's, it's a very different way than you usually see in literature of talking about it. So I was wondering if you could just comment on that, on that tension and sure. if you think it really is one, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's important. And um, I think we can talk about a, a whole other class of, of AI technologies that are interwoven um, with the ones I'm uh, uh, focusing on here. Um, which are not uh, merely about sort of detection, um, uh, if you will, and extraction, uh, but also about influence. Uh, so uh, these are the, tech, the the recommender algorithms, right? The um, the the nudging algorithms, uh, the algorithms that subtly shape our behavior, um, and in holding a mirror up to us, um, and, and through the kinds of training data that they've they've fed, they've been fed. Uh, present to us uh, a, a sort of certain constructed ideal subjectivity, right? Um, that we then have to respond to in, in some way. So I, I think uh, I'm, I, I, this talk has a pretty narrow focus, um, but there are these broader issues about AI that, that have to do with, uh, you know, there's a this great paper by uh, Daniel Susser about the sort of in, invisible influence that uh, these algorithms have. So they're not just passively extracting us and leave, extracting certain, you know, insights from our bodies and then leaving us untouched and unchanged. Um, there's this whole other dimension that you helpfully point out uh, that I, I think I have to think about how to integrate that with what I am trying to highlight. Um, and I, I, one thing I think I could be clearer about, I think it was clear, but maybe it could be clearer. When I talk about extracting the truth from the body, I'm not. I don't think these technologies are really doing that. Um, it, it's not as if that's what's happening. I'm saying that is what the the sort of dream is that these things are being sold as a means of accomplishing. Um, but uh, they are not extracting uh, um, uh, these truths. In fact, there's uh, plenty of literature, and this is this is the whole point about the the pushback. There's plenty of literature, for example, to show that you know, technologies of sentiment analysis are sitting on the shakiest of empirical foundations. And yet uh, it's an absolutely booming market to apply these in every domain imaginable. Um, I'm horrified, for example, by the extent to which people are rushing to use this in education um, to allow uh, teachers supposedly to predict um, and classify the emotional states of their students at different points during a class or, or something like this. Um, I mean, it's, it's a unscientific, it's also invasive and wrong, even if it were scientific, right? Um, and, and easily exploited and abused. Um, so it's one of these things where it, it seems to me wrong all the way down. Uh, and yet um, I, I hear something new every day about a new product that's pushing this as an added bonus feature. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Gus. Marlene. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, I just have a, a quick talk about the, the zombie paper that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's quite related to what you mentioned so far about the pushing back. Like, it seems to me that they have some kind of truth that they are telling, but it's the interpretation that they are giving that is like kind of wrong. Like, for example, uh, you can predict an absence of smile, but it's not a testimony that the person is sad, basically. So they are kind of assuming some kind of causal relation between what they see and what they think. That is, I mean, from my yeah. perspective, that's where like the, the problem is coming. And uh, like, if we have to fight something, maybe this is uh, this, lack, this lack basically of causal relationship that they are assuming. Maybe yeah. this, that's what we should. Yeah, I, I, there were uh, attempts, for example, uh, to um, uh, change the language in some uh, contexts of, uh, uh, of sentiment analysis. So uh, emotion recognition is seen as the most scientifically um, questionable label, right? Um, because emotions are not what's on your face. Um, and so to claim to be able to see emotion is, it, and, and, and the, the, the science to connect the expression on your face with emotion is, um, 
is, is, is simply not robust enough to allow these kinds of, uh, of claims to stand. Um, there's an argument that sentiment is what I'm sort of showing, right? So I might be smiling and the sentiment I'm expressing is happiness, but really I'm irritated with you and why, you know, these are, these are things we do all the time. So maybe the emotion is something else, but here's the sentiment and maybe the system can see the sentiment. Um, and then we could go back one step and say, well, no, even sentiment is uh, something that's affectively laden and, and, and has social and cultural meaning that these systems can't understand. What they can actually measure is expression. You know, what are my lips doing? What, is, what are my eyes doing? And, and there are certain configurations, if you will, that I might be able to, to recognize. Um, but it's hard. And, and, and it doesn't ultimately solve the problem because really a lot of the commercial incentive for these things is to, is to, is to achieve this, this goal of seeing what's in our minds and seeing what's in our hearts and seeing uh, what's in our character. If, if we were honest about what it's doing, these technologies would not sell the way they do. And so the incentives uh, are within the scientific community might be uh, to, uh, to pull these claims back but even in the scientific community, how do you get your paper published in, uh, in nature uh, communications or nature machine intelligence? How do you get your paper uh, talked about by Wired um, in a way that's going to make your, your provost happy uh, and, uh, and your department happy? Uh, it's not going to happen when you describe your research uh, in these very modest and restrained and careful ways. It's going to be. It's going to happen when you're willing to let the press release out uh, that says that you've uh, figured out how to find criminals from uh, from CCTV. Um, so, yeah. The, so, I, I I think you're right, Marlene. That you know there are ways to talk about what this technology is doing that might preserve its utility and its scientific cred credibility without us having to throw all the research in the garbage. We could say here's what it's actually doing, let's be real about this. But the problem is often what it's actually doing doesn't sell. Great, thanks Marlene, thanks Shannon. Avery, our last question. Um, thanks so much for this really interesting talk and discussion. Uh, I wanna ask you about what you're calling unconsented truth and its connection to research ethics, specifically in a university setting. Um, the Hashemi and Hall study that you mentioned in your slides mm -hmm. is a really interesting example because um, that study did come out and then a few months later it was retracted. And it was retracted because, uh, as the journal noted, the authors had failed to comply with IRB requests. Um, and, you know, that particular issue of the IRB is when I was thinking about while you were talking about mm -hmm. um, research and how it's being zombieized by AI. Um, because uh, it makes me think about other issues with data scraping. Um, for example, um, Kierkegaard, since we're having a philosophy conversation here, I love that this is Kierkegaard et al's OK Cupid data set. Yes. Um, right? Where um, these researchers posted a data set for use by the scientific community. Uh, that was scraped from OKCupid without consent, right? So this is unconsented truth. Um, and the argument that was made by those researchers um, was that, well, it's okay to use this data because this is in a public forum and there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, so we don't, this data doesn't need to go through IRB protocols. And as I've been doing my own research into this, I've noticed that whether or not something is subject to IRB research in AI, is kind of a, an open question. So I wonder if you have any thoughts or maybe recommendations about that. Um, but also I was thinking about how so much of this AI research reboots a lot of experimental psychology research. Um, so for example, the gate, the gate uh, identification of a person by gate, uh, that's, mm -hmm. that goes back to the 90s. Um, a lot of resurgence of face recognition, um, things about voter voting for facial competence, et cetera. There are studies about that from the 80s onwards. Um, and then it kind of dies out and then all of a sudden it's had a resurgence. So I wonder if that's something you've tracked and do you have any thoughts on how IRBs need to deal with this kind of problem? Um, thanks so much for this talk. Yeah, th uh, thanks. Y yeah, I think um, uh, IRBs in, in um, uh, the North American context and uh, research ethics committees and um, uh, in, in the UK context here um, are really struggling 
uh, in many cases to kind of catch up uh, with the technology and also not just the changes in the technology, but the changes in the norms. So um, it's now, you know, considered broadly speaking important to think about the expectations of users when they uh, make data public, what are they making it data, uh, that data public for? For what purpose? What are the plausible uses of this data? Um, and um, the idea that somehow the minute you put it into the public realm, you have no expectation of privacy. Um, five, 10 years ago, that seemed plausible to a lot of researchers. Um, very, uh, 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 very many more today see it as profoundly unethical to, uh, uh, to treat public data as sort of indiscriminately uh, um, up for grabs. And so, you know, we've got, you know, accounts, for example, like Helen Nissenbaum's account of privacy as contextual integrity that helped people's views of this mature considerably. Um, but the, the sort of notions of what we can do on the research side, um, have not moved, have not matured as quickly. And so um, one of the things I'm involved in uh, here at the University of Edinburgh is looking at these things uh, with our research ethics community and thinking about, okay, how do we incorporate um, some of these new uh, risks? How do we incorporate some of these new understandings of, uh, of, of data, for example? And, and simply the fact that in the social media environment, um, the idea of individual data that's owned by an individual person um, and that simply exposes you is really completely outmoded. Um, the, the tools that we have now, for the most part, almost all data about you can be used to, uh, to affect people like you or people related to you or people that you interact with. And so even if I am very careful with my data, it may not matter at all in terms of the risk uh, that I'm exposed to from these kinds of systems if enough people who I'm connected to or who resemble me in certain ways have their data scraped. And so uh, we really are moving towards a radically different views of data than we had in the 80s or 90s when a lot of the research ethics codes around these things were, uh, were kind of well established. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of work being done um, and uh, uh, there's, there's a good number of resources that are starting to come out about how research ethics codes can evolve uh, to incorporate um, these kinds of uh, these kinds of developments. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, Avery. Thank you, Shannon, for just a truly wonderful lyrical talk and very uh, meaningful and and inspiring on this in this area. Thanks to everybody else for for joining us today. Next week is our last talk of the the term. It's Matt Ratto. Uh, speaking on and human behavioral intervention and counseling bots. Uh, so please join us for that. And thanks again, Shannon. Really wonderful to see you and hear Thank from you, you for inviting me and thank you for the great conversation and uh, really enjoyed it. So great, great to see you all. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.